Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Our next passage is in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope, When you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. I went too far. (laughs) Skip down to verse 29 through 32. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. Romans chapter 11, verses 11 through 16. Thirty-six. Okay, Romans 11, 11 through 36. Again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? I am talking to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fail, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And if they do not persist, and if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut off, of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion He will turn godliness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you were at one time disobedient to God, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience. So they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. 
For God has bound everyone over to disobedience, so that he may have mercy on them all. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his past beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Next passage is Second Chronicles. Chapter 7, verse 14. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And we have one more passage in Ezekiel 38, verse 8. Ezekiel 38, verse 8. After many days, you will be called to arms. In future years you will invade a land that has recovered from war, whose people were gathered from many nations, to the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They had been brought out from the nations, and now all of them live in safety. Is there children's church? Children, you may be dismissed. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Good to see each one of you this morning. I want to thank again the women in this church that provide dinners for people. And a neat dinner for the family of Dennis Lynx, who passed away last Sunday. We had the funeral yesterday in the Mountain Springs Church, and then we had the dinner here later. When we were up at the grave, the burial, we had a rainstorm. Then John was one who was standing out in the rain is one of the group that did the firing to honor the military experience of Dennis. <clears throat> I'm going to preach on Romans 11 today, and uh, Alan read a good portion of it. And it has to be a very confusing piece of scripture. And I hope by the time I'm through talking today, it will no longer be confusing. Okay? But it will be a framework upon which you can hang the history of God's work among his people. Now, I want to have you, uh, in your imagination, come along with me for a minute, and I'm going to talk about something that I don't know anything about. Maybe you don't know anything about it either, but if you do, don't make fun of me, okay? I'm just trying to do my best. We want to talk about a tree. A tree that is a natural tree to the area. Very healthy, very strong. Like the trees you see now in North Idaho that are so lush. Many of them so filled with flowers. But no fruit. Fruit. 
And then I want you to think of a tree that you've noticed that just has been planted by somebody, or by the house, and it's filled with fruit every year. But it's prone to die off and not do well. And you'll say, well, I know what I should do. I should take this tree that is so strong and natural, and I should cut the limbs off of that. They don't bear fruit. And then I should take the limbs that do bear fruit and cut them off of that tree and graft them into the strong tree. And I think you do that by splitting the candium layer of the tree, opening it up slightly and poking a branch of the fruit-bearing tree in there and wrapping it. And lo and behold, it will grow into that tree. And you'll have a strong root trunk system supporting a strong fruit-bearing branch. You got that picture in your mind? That explains the 11th chapter of Romans. You see, back in the 12th chapter of Genesis, God called a special man unto himself, and he called him Abraham. And he said, Abraham, I'm going to uh, call you to be my special people, your family and their family and on and on. You're act actually, your descendants will be like the sand of the seashore. Many, many, many people will descend from your family. And I want to use your family to reveal myself to the world. I want people to come to know about me. And I'm going to use your family to reveal myself to the world. And we find in history that is indeed what he has done. Through the writers of the Old Testament, he revealed himself to the world. But strange as it may seem, the people that descended from Abraham were not faithful people. They were not people that loved God. They loved idols. They loved themselves. When it came to obeying God, they were rebellious. And in that way, they bore no fruit. And so God cut them off. Let them be taken captive by other Countries of the world at that time, Assyria, Babylonia, Medo-Persia, scattered all over the world. And no longer revealing God to the world. They were instrumental and they continue to be instrumental in a lot of the creations and the end. In inventions of the, the, we do, a lot of medical things they discover. I mean, Jewish people are tremendously intelligent, creative people. But not to God. When God decided to do something different, he said, I'm going to send my son down there to reveal me. <laughs> Let him tell the people about who I am and what I am like. And so he did. And Jesus came and lived among us. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And, and then we know how he died on the cross. And then his disciples went everywhere revealing the truth of Jesus. And now we have a great group of people 
that have been grafted in to the tree for the purpose of bearing fruit. You see, with God, starting with Abraham, there were two kinds of people in the world. They were the people that followed God, were called the Jews. They were the foundation tree that had roots deep, trunks strong, just no fruit in the branches. They disobeyed God and turned against him. And so he cut them off, and in their place, he put in the branches that were grafted in. And he called these people Gentiles before they were grafted in, and then, of course, they are part of his family after they're grafted in. Now, it's inconceivable that the entire rest of the world, apart from the Jews, were called Gentiles and were outside of his family. But it's true, still true. It's also true that God wants them all in his family. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Jesus told us, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. I want everybody to know about me, and I want to graft them in. So they can become part of my family. But I'm not through with the Jews yet. There's coming a time when they will look on him whom they have pierced. Who they nailed to a tree on the cross. And when they see that, they're going to repent. And be grafted back in. Romans 11 make more sense now? I think so. I hope so. It's the outline on which you can put the details of history. That's what this world is all about. Those political entities that have occurred in this world since the time of Abraham have been like the drop of a bucket after you've dumped it all out. Oh, there's a little left, so you let it drip out. That's how important the political entities of this world are to God. He doesn't deal through them. They're little Mickey Mouse games that men play. And God works right through them to perform his purpose. And so it is true that there came a time that uh, the Jews were laid aside as far as history is concerned. And indeed they were scattered all over the world. But very mysteriously in about 1930... A whole bunch of them started to get the idea that they wanted to go back to Palestine. It wasn't their land. They didn't have a government there. But we want to go back there. So they went there against political entities in this world. And they started flowing in to Palestine. Now, people already lived in Palestine. So they were walking into a vacuum. They were walking into a place that were already inhabited, populated. By Palestinians. But they didn't care. They just came to shore anyway. Then he went to battle with some of the political entities and figured out a way to be accepted as a nation. 1948 they were. Had a blood moon there too, incidentally, if you read on blood moons. Now the Jews are back 
in their country. 1967, they expanded their country a little bit. And they're still arguing <laughs> with the Palestinians who they displaced. Think about that any way you want to. But they have a right to that land. God said so. And they are there. They will be there. They will expand there in the coming days. Now they aren't grafted back in yet because they're not believing. They're just <laughs> unbelievably obeying the urge to go home. And they're coming home from Africa, from Russia, from Europe, from oh, all over the world. That's what God's doing. That's what God's doing. Now we have a heresy, I believe, that's going around today that says that when Jesus died on the cross, he opened up God's mercy to the Gentiles, to the people that were not Jews. And when Rome came and took care of Jerusalem, destroyed it in 70 and 90 A.D., God forgot about the Jews, gave them up. All of the blessings that he promised to the Jews in the Old Testament, he now has promised to the Christians. Replacement theology is what it's called. And there's a lot of people that believe that today. And if they want to believe that, they can believe that. I just don't think the Bible teaches that. I think the Bible teaches that when God called Abraham... His calling was irrevocable. You said it right here to us today. His callings are without change. And he is going to, in the process of time, graft those Israelites, those Jews, right back into his plan and purpose, and they will bear fruit to the glory of his name. So that's what I believe Romans 11 talks about. Now, interestingly enough, Peter comes along, just like John the Baptist did, and started talking to people about repenting. Repenting. What are you talking about? What, what, what does that mean? It means to change your mind. It means to change the way you're going. If you want to go to Canada from here, and you take off on 95 north out of town, and when you get to three mile, you turn right and head out to Canada, it isn't long before you'll realize that you're going to end up in Montana, not Canada. And so you... Next chance you get, you turn around, you repent, and go back to three mile and go to Canada, right? Now, we talked about something that's very simple to do in a car. It's not that simple to do in a great big truck. <laughs> but you can turn around. And so we can take the word repent, which we can apply to what the Jews will do, we read it in Chronicles, and we can apply it to us, like Peter did. You see, Peter just got through telling the Jews, before he said that, you've taken the Lord of glory and crucified him. And they said, well, then what can we do? And he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Change your mind. Jesus is not an accursed imposter. 
Jesus is the true Son of God, like he said he was. Change your mind. That's what Peter said. And as we think of that today, what does it mean? It means that we need to learn to change our mind. Because unbelievable as it might seem to you, we're not right. There isn't anybody here that is right. Oh, there are some things that are about there that are right. But before God, God says all of your righteousness that you think are right are like filthy rags. I want you to be like me, God says. Not like you. Well then, like the Jews said to Peter, what should we do, Lord? He says, repent. You know what interested me about 9-11? For a few weeks, more people went to church. People thought that was wonderful. I didn't at all. I thought it was a hypocritical. Making fools out of themselves. You know why? Because they didn't repent. They kept slaughtering babies. They kept totally disregarding God's laws concerning marriage. And I'm just getting started. They didn't repent. We didn't repent. We've continued on our merry, destructive way. And we wonder why a little 16-year-old brings a gun to school and shoots down his teacher. Perfectly normal procedure for those who think only of themselves. Do not consider others and who have no knowledge of God. All of us come before God. And as we read his word, we will realize that, you know what? I don't think that's right. (laughs) I've been doing that. You know, most of us learn how to cuss when we're young. Isn't that amazing? And little kids think it's so smart to copy their daddies when they hear him cussing. That's where they learn it. By other people. Lots of times from parents. Now parents can be real sloppy in their speech. I know I'm one. I can be sloppy. But as you come to the Lord, sooner or later that speech will be brought to your attention. And you'll say, I I don't think I should cuss anymore. I had a boss in the oil fields. His name was Odie Bess. He was a despicable character. Because all he could do was cuss. And we roused about leaders would take turns working with him. Because we could take it for only so long. And I don't care whether you are a believer or not. I mean, that, that gets old. And I don't know how you feel about it. When I hear the name Jesus Christ spoken in disregard and disrespect, it hurts me. Just like it hurts me when I see somebody mean to a little child. I love Jesus. He's special to me. Why can you say that? How can you say What are you doing? And you know what? Years later, I took a trip to California. I camped in Carpinteria, which is just south of Santa Barbara. And I noticed the people that were in the park 
for the night over there a ways. And I went over, and lo and behold, it was Odie Beth. He had found the Lord, and he wasn't cussing. That blessed me. It blesses me right now. Because that man had a habit. And he quit. He repented. It says in Romans 12, we should be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, by changing your behavior. And as you ask the Lord, what do you want me to do? Do that. It's a good thing to do. Doesn't hurt to do that every day. Lord, what do you want me to do? When he reveals that to you, then quit doing what you have been doing there and do what he wants you to do, okay? That's repentance. Now, the reason that's important is because we already have an object lesson. What God does to people that do not obey him, that rebel in his presence and disregard his commandments. And don't get so proud you think he can't do the same thing to you. We aren't playing games here. We're dealing with eternal realities. And praise God, he sent Jesus to help us not only know who we are, but who we can become. I am a special creation of God. I have been totally and fully forgiven for every sin I can ever commit or ever committed or whatever. I am totally covered with the righteousness of Jesus. And when I really become convinced of that, it's not nearly so hard to quit cussing. It kind of takes the whatever out of it that made me cuss in the first place. Why would I do it? <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. It's a byword. You know what I mean by byword? A word spoken that has no meaning. It doesn't express what you want to say. Why do you say it? And, and, and. You can add that to any kind of behavior we have that is not God's will. And we all have that behavior. And we all need to repent. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, for the privilege that we have of changing our mind. We thank you, Father, for the complete forgiveness that you've already given us in Jesus Christ. That he has come and became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And Father, I thank you for the way you command history. How you <clears throat> plan and perform your purpose. And I am so glad that we're part of that. That is so exciting. I praise you, Father, that what you've been working at for thousands of years, we're nearing the completion of, and, and we're actually experiencing. A big part of it right now. We thrill that the Jews are back in their land. Because we read it in the Bible where it was written hundreds of years ago. And now they're there. Hallelujah. You are true to your purpose. I'm so glad you do not change. Regardless of who we are or where we are, we can always turn to you. And find your love and your kindness and your acceptance. Thank you so much for loving me. For loving everyone here this morning. And making each of us.
part of your plan and purpose. And we thank you for this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. I will have a video.